Chapter Ten of Emily Bronte by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Prospectuses. Gradually, Charlotte's first depression wore away. Long discussions with Emily as they took their walks over the moors long silent brooding of ways and means as they sat together in the parlour making shirts for branwell long thinking brought new counsel she went moreover to stay with her friend ellen and the change helped to restore her weakened health she writes to her friend dear nell march twenty fifth i got home safely and was not too much tired on arriving at haworth i feel rather better to-day than i have been and in time I hope to regain more strength. I found Emily and Papa well, and a letter from Branwell intimating that he and Anne were pretty well, too. Emily is much obliged to you for the seeds you sent. She wishes to know if the Sicilian pea and the crimson cornflower are hardy flowers, or if they are delicate and should be sown in warm and sheltered situations. Write to me tomorrow and let me know how you all are, if your mother continues to get better. Good morning, dear Nell. I shall say no more to you at present. See Bronte. Monday morning. Our poor little cat has been ill two days and is just dead. It is piteous to see even an animal lying lifeless. Emily is sorry. Side by side with all these lighter cares went on the schemes for the school. At last the two sisters determined to begin as soon as they saw a fair chance of getting pupils. They began the search in good earnest, but fortunately postponed the necessary alterations in the house until they had the secure promise of, at any rate, three or four. Then their demands lessened as day by day the chance became more difficult and fainter. In early summer Charlotte writes, as soon as i can get a chance of only one pupil i will have cards of terms printed and will commence the repairs necessary in the house i wish all to be done before the winter i think of fixing the board and english education at twenty five pounds per annum still no pupil was heard of but the girls went courageously on writing to every mother of daughters with whom they could claim acquaintance but alas it was the case with one that her children were already at school in liverpool with another that her child had just been promised to miss c with a third that she thought the undertaking praiseworthy but haworth was so very remote a spot in vain did the girls explain that from some points of view the retired situation was an advantage since had they set up school in some fashionable place they would have had house rent to pay and could not possibly have offered an excellent education for twenty-five pounds a year. Parents are an expectant people. Still, every lady promised to recommend the school to mothers less squeamish or less engaged, and knowing how well they should show themselves worthy of the chance, once they had obtained it, Charlotte and Emily took heart to hope. The holidays arrived, and still nothing was settled. Anne came home and helped in the laying of schemes and writing of letters, but alas, Branwell also came home, irritable, extravagant, wildly gay, or gloomily moping. His sisters could no longer blind themselves to the fact that he drank, drank habitually, to excess, and Anne had fears, vague, terrible, foreboding, which she could not altogether make plain. By this time they had raised the charge to thirty-five pounds, considering, perhaps, that their first offer had been so low as to discredit their attempt. But still they got no favorable answers. It was hard, for the girls had not been chary of time, money, or trouble to fit themselves for their occupation. Looking round, they could count up many schoolmistresses far less thoroughly equipped. Only the Brontes had no interest. Meanwhile, Branwell amused himself as best he could. There was always the black bull with its admiring circle of drink fellows, and the girls who admired Patrick's courteous bow and Patrick's winning smile. Good people all who little dreamed how much vice, how much misery they were encouraging by their approbation. 
Mr. Grundy, too, came over now and then to see his old friend. I knew them all, he says, the father, upright, handsome, distantly courteous, white-haired, tall. Knowing me as his son's friend, he would treat me in the Grandisonian fashion, coming himself down to the little inn to invite me, a boy, up to his house, where I would be coldly uncomfortable until I could escape with Patrick Branwell to the moors. The daughters, distant and distrait, large of nose, small of figure, red of hair, prominent of spectacles, showing great intellectual development, but with eyes constantly cast down, very silent, painfully retiring. This was about the time of their first literary adventures, say 1843 or 1844. But of literary adventure there was at present little thought. The school still occupied their thoughts and dreams. At last, no pupil coming forward, some cards of terms were printed and given for distribution to the friends of Charlotte and Anne. Emily had no friends. There are none left of them, those pitiful cards of terms never granted, records of such unfruitful hopes. They have fitly vanished, like the ghosts of children never born, and quicker still to vanish was the dream that called them forth. The weeks went on, and every week of seven letterless mornings, every week of seven anxious nights, made the sisters more fully aware that notice and employment would not come to them in the way they had dreamed, made them think it well that Branwell's home should not be the dwelling of innocent children. Aunt went back to her work, leaving the future as uncertain as before. In October, Charlotte, always the spokeswoman, writes again to her friend and diligent helper in this matter. Dear Nell, I, Emily, and Anne are truly obliged to you for the efforts you have made in our behalf, and if you have not been successful, you are only like ourselves. Everyone wishes us well, but there are no pupils to be had. We have no present intention, however, of breaking our hearts on the subject, still less of feeling mortified at our defeat. The effort must be beneficial, whatever the result may be, because it teaches us experience and an additional knowledge of this world. I send you two additional circulars, and will send you two more if you desire it, when I write again. These four circulars also came to nothing. It was now more than six months since the three sisters had begun their earnest search for pupils, more than three years since they had taken for the ruling aim of their endeavors the formation of this little school. Not one pupil could they secure, not one promise. At last they knew that they were beaten. In November, Charlotte writes again to Ellen, We have made no alterations yet in our house. It would be folly to do so while there is so little likelihood of our ever getting pupils. I fear you are giving yourself too much trouble on our account. Depend on it, if you were to persuade a mamma to bring her child to Haworth, the aspect of the place would frighten her, and she would probably take the dear girl back with her in Stanter. We are glad that we have made the attempt, and we will not be cast down because it has not succeeded. There was no more to be said, only to put carefully by as one puts by the thoughts of an interrupted marriage. All the dreams that had filled so many months, only to lay aside in a drawer, as one lays aside the long sonat garments of a stillborn child, the plans drawn out for the builder, the printed cards, the lists of books to get, only to face again a future of separate toil among strangers, to renounce the vision of a home together. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Emily Bronte by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Branwell's Fall. As the spring grew upon the moors, dappling them with fresh verdant shoots, clearing the sky overhead, loosening the winds to rush across them, as the beautiful season grew ripe in Haworth, every one of its days made clearer to the two anxious women waiting there 
in what shape their blurred foreboding would come true at last they seldom spoke of branwell now it was a hard and anxious time ever expectant of an evil just at hand minor troubles too gathered round this shapeless boded grief mr bronte was growing blind charlotte ever nervous feared the same fate and could do but little sewing with her weak cherished eyesight anne's letters told of health worn out by constant agonizing suspicion it was emily that strong bearer of burdens on whom the largest share of work was laid charlotte grew really weak as the summer came her sensitive vehement nature felt anxiety as a physical pain she was constantly with her father her spirit sank with his as month by month his sight grew sensibly weaker the old man to whom his own importance was so dear suffered keenly indeed from the fear of actual blindness and more from the horror of dependence than from the dread of pain or privation he fears he will be nothing in the parish says sorrowful charlotte and as her father never impatient never peevish became more deeply cast down and anxious she too became nervous and fearful she too dejected at last when june came and brought no brightness to that gray old house with the invisible shadow ever hovering above it charlotte was persuaded to seek rest and change in the home of her friend near leeds anne was home now she had come back ill miserable she had suspicions that made her feel herself degraded pure soul concerning her brother's relation with her employer's wife many letters had passed between them through her hands too too often had she heard her unthinking little pupils threaten their mother into more than customary indulgence saying unless you do as we wish we shall tell papa about mr bronte the poor girl felt herself an involuntary accomplice to that treachery that deceit to lie down at night under the roof to break by day the bread of the good sick bedridden man whose honour she could not but fear was in jeopardy from her own brother such dire strain was too much for that frail dejected nature and yet to say openly to herself that branwell had committed this disgrace it was impossible rather must her suspicions be the morbid promptings of a diseased mind she was wicked to have felt them poor gentle anne sweet prim little body such scenes such unhallowed vicinities of lust were not for you at last sickness came and set her free she went home home with its constant labour pure air of good works home with its sickness and love its dread for others and noble sacrifice of self how welcome was it to her wounded spirit and yet this infinitely lighter torment was wearing charlotte out they persuaded her to go away and when she had yielded strove to keep her away emily writes to ellen in july dear miss nucy if you have set your heart on charlotte staying another week she has our united consent i for one will take everything easy on sunday i am glad she is enjoying herself let her make the most of the next seven days to return stout and hearty love to her and you from anne and myself and tell her all are well at home yours emily bronte charlotte stayed the extra week benefiting largely thereby she started for home and enjoyed her journey for she travelled with a french gentleman and talked again with delight the sweet language which had left such lingering echoes in her memory which forbade her to feel quite contented any more in her secluded yorkshire home slight as it was the little excitement did her good feeling brave and ready to face and fight with a legion of shadows she reached the gate of her own home went in branwell was there he had been sent home a day or two before apparently for a holiday he must have known that some discovery had been made at last he must have felt he never would return. Anne, too, must have had some misgivings, yet the worst was not known yet. 
Emily at least could not guess it. Not for long this truce with open disgrace. The very day of Charlotte's return, a letter had come for Branwell from his employer. All had been found out. This letter commanded Branwell never to see again the mother of the children under his care, never set foot in her home, never write or speak to her. Branwell, who loved her passionately, had in that moment no thought for the shame, the black disgrace he had brought on his father's house. He stormed raved, swore he could not live without her, cried out against her next for staying with her husband, then prayed the sick man might die soon, they would yet be happy, ah, he would never see her again. A strange scene in the quiet parlour of a country vicarage, this anguish of guilty love, these revulsions from shameful ecstasy to shameful despair. Branwell raved on, delirious, agonised, and the blind father listened, sick at heart, maybe self-reproachful, and the gentle sister listened, shuddering, as if she saw hell lying open at her feet. Emily listened, too, indignant at the treachery, horrified at the shame, yet with an immense pity in her fierce and loving breast. To this scene Charlotte entered. Charlotte, with her vehement sense of right, Charlotte, with her sturdy indignation, when she at last understood the whole guilty corrupted passion that had wrecked two homes, she turned away with something in her heart suddenly stiffened, dead. It was her passionate love for this shameful erring brother, once as dear to her as her own soul. Yet she was very patient. She writes to a friend quietly and without too much disdain. We have had sad work with Branwell. He thought of nothing but stunning or drowning his agony of mind, in what fashion the reader knows ere now. No one in this house could have rest, and at last we have been obliged to send him from home for a week with someone to look after him. He has written to me this morning expressing some sense of contrition, but as long as he remains at home I scarce dare hope for peace in the house. We must all, I fear, prepare for a season of distress and disquietude. A weary and a hopeless time. Branwell came back, better in body, but in no wise holier in mind. His one hope was that his enemy might die, die soon, and that things might be as they had been before. No thought of repentance. What money he had, he spent in gin or opium. Anything to deaden recollection. A woman still lives at Haworth who used to help in the housework at the Black Bull. She still remembers how in the early morning, pale, red-eyed, he would come into the passage of the inn with his beautiful bow and sweep of the lifted hat, with his courteous smile and ready, good morning, Anne. Then he would turn to the bar and feeling in his pockets for what small monies he might have, sixpence, eightpence, tenpence, as the case might be, he would order so much gin and sit there drinking till it was all gone, then sit still there silent, or sometimes he would passionately speak of the woman he loved, of her beauty, sweetness, of how he longed to see her again. He loved to speak of her, even to a dog. He would talk of her, by the hour, to his dog. Yet, lest we pity this real despair, let us glance at one of this man's letters. How could such vulgar weakness, such corrupt and loathsome sentimentality, such maudlin, macabre penitence, yet feel so much? No easy task to judge of a misery too perverse for pity, too sincere for absolute contempt. It is again to Mr. Grundy that he writes. Since I last shook hands with you in Halifax, two summers ago, my life till lately has been one of apparent happiness and indulgence, you will ask, why does he complain then? I can only reply by showing the undercurrent of distress which bore my bark to a whirlpool, despite the surface waves of life that seemed floating me to peace. In a letter begun in the spring of 1843, sick 1845, and never finished, owing to incessant attacks of illness, I tried to tell you that I was tutor to the son of a wealthy gentleman whose wife is sister to the wife of blank, an M.P., and the cousin of Lord Blank. This lady, 
though her husband detested me, showed me a degree of kindness which, when I was deeply grieved one day at her husband's conduct, ripened into declarations of more than ordinary feeling. My admiration of her mental and personal attractions, my knowledge of her unselfish sincerity, her sweet temper and unwearied care for others, with but unrequited return where most should have been given, although she is seventeen years my senior, all combined to an attachment on my part and led to reciprocations which I had little looked for. Three months since I received a furious letter from my employer, threatening to shoot me if I returned from my vacation, which I was passing at home, and letters from her lady's maid and physician informed me of the outbreak, only checked by her firm courage and resolution, that whatever harm came to her, none should come to me. I have lain for nine long weeks utterly shattered in body and broken down in mind. The probability of her becoming free to give me herself and estate never rose to drive away the prospect of her decline under her present grief. I dreaded, too, the wreck of my mind and body which, God knows, during a short life have been most severely tried. Eleven continuous nights of sleepless horror reduced me to almost blindness, and being taken into Wales to recover the sweet scenery, the sea, the sound of music, caused me fits of unspeakable distress. You will say, what a fool! But if you knew the many causes that I have for sorrow which I cannot even hint at here, you would perhaps pity as well as blame. At the kind request of Mr. Macaulay and Mr. Baines I have striven to arouse my mind by writing something worthy of being read, but I really cannot do so. Of course, you will despise the writer of all this. I can only answer that the writer does the same and would not wish to live if he did not hope that work and change may yet restore him. Apologizing sincerely for what seems like whining egotism, and hardly daring to hint about days when in your company I could sometimes sink the thoughts which remind me of departed days, I fear, departed never to return, I remain, and etc. Unhappy Branwell, some consolation he derives in his utmost sorrow from the fact that the lady of his love can employ her own lady's maid and physician to write letters to her exiled lover. It is clear that his pride is gratified by this irregular association with a lord. He can afford to wait, stupefied with drink and drugs, till that happy time shall come when he can step forward and claim herself an estate. Henceforward, Branwell Bronte, Esquire, J.P., and a person of position in the county. Such paradisal future dawns above this present purgatory of pains and confusion. That phrase concerning herself and estate is peculiarly apocalyptic. It sheds a quite new light upon a fact which in Mrs. Gaskell's time was regarded as a proof that some remains of conscience still stirred within this miserable fellow. Some months after his dismissal, toward the end of this unhappy year of 1845, he met this lady at Harrogate by appointment. It is said that she proposed a flight together, ready to forfeit all her grandeur. It was Branwell who advised patience and a little longer waiting. Maybe, though she herself was dear, although seventeen years my senior, herself an estate was estimably dearer. And yet he was in earnest, yet it was a question of life and death, of heaven or hell with him. If he could not have her, he would have nothing. He would ruin himself and all he could. Most like in this rage of vain despair, some passionate baby that shrieks and hits and tears, convulsed because it may not have the moon. Small wonder that Charlotte's coldness, aggravated by continual outrage on Branwell's part, gradually became contempt and silence. In proportion as she had exalted in this brother, hoped all for him, did she now shrink from him, bitterly chill at heart. I begin to fear, she says, the once ambitious sister, that he has rendered himself incapable of filling any respectable station in life. 
she cannot ask ellen to come to see her because he is in the house and while he is here you shall not come i am more confirmed in that resolution the more i see of him i wish i could say one word to you in his favour but i cannot i will hold my tongue for some while she hoped that the crisis would pass and that then no matter how humbly the more obscurely the better he would at least earn honest bread away from home such was not his intention he professed to be too ill to leave haworth and ill no doubt he was from continually eating of opium and daily drinking of drams he stuck to his comfortable quarters to the black bull just across the churchyard heedless of what discomfort he gave to others branwell offers no prospect of hope says charlotte again how can we be more comfortable so long as branwell stays at home and degenerates instead of improving it has been intimated that he would be received again where he was formerly stationed if he would behave more steadily but he refuses to make the effort he will not work and at home he is a drain on every resource an impediment to all happiness but there's no use in complaining small use indeed yet once more she forced herself to make the hopeless effort after some more than customary outbreak of the man who was drinking himself into madness and ruin she writes in the march of eighteen forty six to her friend and comforter ellen i went into the room where branwell was to speak to him about an hour after i got home it was very forced work to address him i might have spared myself the trouble as he took no notice and made no reply he was stupefied my fears were not vain i hear that he got a sovereign while i was away under pretence of paying a pressing debt he went immediately and changed it at a public house and has employed it as was to be expected concluded her account by saying that he was a hopeless being it is too true in his present state it is scarcely possible to stay in the room where he is it must be about that time that she forever gave up expostulation or complaint in this matter i will hold my tongue she had said and she kept her word for more than two years she held an utter silence to him living under the same roof witnessing day by day his ever-deepening degradation no syllable crossed her lips to him since she could not for the sake of those she loved and might comfort refuse the loathsome daily touch and presence of sin she endured it but would have no fellowship therewith she had no right over it it none over her she looked on speechless that man was dead to her anne in whom the fibre of indignation was less strong followed less sternly in her sister's wake she had says charlotte in her memoir in the course of her life been called upon to contemplate near at hand and for a long time the terrible effects of talent misused and faculties abused hers was naturally a sensitive reserved and dejected nature what she saw went very deeply into her mind it did her harm the spectacle of this harm coming undeserved to so dear frail and innocent a creature absorbed all charlotte's pity there was none left for branwell but there was one woman's heart strong enough in its compassion to bear the daily disgusts weaknesses sins of branwell's life and yet persist in aid and affection night after night when mr bronte was in bed when anne and charlotte had gone upstairs to their room emily still sat up waiting she often had very long to wait in the silent house before the staggering tread the muttered oath the fumbling hand at the door bade her rouse herself from her sad thoughts and rise to let in the prodigal and lead him safely to his rest but she never wearied in her kindness in that silent home it was the silent emily who had ever a cheering word for branwell it was emily who still remembered that he was her brother without that remembrance freezing her heart to numbness she still hoped to win him back by love and the very force and sincerity of his guilty passion an additional horror and sin in her sister's eyes was a claim on emily 
ever sympathetic to violent feeling thus it was she who more than the others became familiarized with the agony and doubts and shame of that tormented soul and if in her little knowledge of the world she imagined such rested passions to be natural it is not upon her of a certainty that the blame of her pity shall be laid as the time went on and branwell grew worse and wilder it was well for the lonely watcher that she was strong at last he grew ill and would be content to go to bed early and lie there half stupefied with opium and drink one such night their father and branwell being in bed the sisters came upstairs to sleep emily had gone on first into the little passage room where she still slept when charlotte passing branwell's partly opened door saw a strange bright flare inside oh emily she cried the house is on fire emily came out her fingers at her lips she had remembered her father's great horror of fire it was the one dread of a brave man he would have no muslin curtains no light dresses in his house she came out silently and saw the flame then very white and determined dashed from her room downstairs into the passage where every night full pails of water stood one in each hand she came upstairs and charlotte the young servant shrinking against the wall huddled together in amazed horror emily went straight on and entered the blazing room in a short while the bright light ceased to flare fortunately the flame had not reached the woodwork drunken branwell turning in his bed must have upset the light on to his sheets for they in the bed were all on fire and he unconscious in the midst when emily went in even as jane eyre found mr rochester but it was no reasonable thankful human creature with whom emily had to deal after a few long moments those still standing in the passage saw her stagger out white with singed clothes half carrying in her arms half dragging her besotted brother she placed him in her bed and took away the light then assuring the hysterical girls that there could be no further danger she bade them go and rest but where she slept herself that night no one remembers now it must be very soon after this that branwell began to sleep in his father's room the old man courageous enough and conceiving that his presence might be some slight restraint on the drunken furies of his unhappy son persisted in this arrangement though often enough the girls begged him to relinquish it knowing well enough what risk of life he ran not infrequently branwell would declare that either he or his father should be dead before the morning and well might it happen that in his insensate delirium he should murder the blind old man the sisters often listened for the report of a pistol in the dead of the night till watchful eye and hearkening ear grew heavy and dull with the perpetual strain upon their nerves in the mornings young bronte would saunter out saying with a drunkard's incontinence of speech the poor old man and i have had a terrible night of it he does his best the poor old man but it's all over with me whimpering it's her fault her fault and in such fatal progress two years went on bringing the suffering in that house ever lower ever deeper sinking it day by day from bad to worse End of chapter 11chapter 12 of emily bronte by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami writing poetry while emily bronte's hands were full of trivial labor while her heart was buried with its charge of shame and sorrow think not that her mind was more at rest she had always used her leisure to study or create and the dreariness of existence made this inner life of hers doubly precious now there is a tiny copy of the poems of ellis currer and acton bell which was emily's own marked with her name and with the date of every poem carefully written under its title in her own cramped and tidy writing it has been of great use to me in classifying the order of these poems chiefly hymns to imagination emily's comforter 
her fairy love beseeching her to light such a light in the soul that the dull clouds of earthly skies may seem of scant significance the light that should be lit was indeed of supernatural brightness a flame from under the earth a flame of lightning from the skies a beacon of awful warning although so much is scarcely evident in these early poems gleaming with fantastic glowworm fires fairy prettinesses or burning as solemnly and pale as tapers lit in daylight round a bier yet in whatever shape the light that never was on sea or land the strange transfiguring shine of imagination is present there no one in the house ever saw what things emily wrote in the moments of pause from her pastry making in those brief sittings under the currents in those long and lonely watches for her drunken brother she did not write to be read but only to relieve a burdened heart one day writes charlotte in eighteen fifty recollecting the near vanished past one day in the autumn of eighteen forty five i accidentally lighted on a manuscript volume of verse in my sister emily's handwriting of course i was not surprised knowing that she could and did write verse i looked it over and something more than surprise seized me a deep conviction that these were not common effusions not at all like the poetry women generally write i thought them condensed and terse vigorous and genuine to my ear they had also a peculiar music wild melancholy and elevating very true these poems with their surplus of imagination their instinctive music and irregular rightness of form their sweeping impressiveness effects of landscape their scant allusions to dogma or perfidious man are indeed not at all like the poetry women generally write the hand that painted this single line the dim moon struggling in the sky should have shaken hands with coleridge the voice might have sung in concert with blake that sang this single bit of a song hope was but a timid friend she sat without the grated den watching how my fate would tend even as selfish-hearted men she was cruel in her fear through the bars one dreary day i looked out to see her there and she turned her face away had the poem ended here it would have been perfect but it and many more of these lyrics have the uncertainty of close that usually marks early work often incoherent too the pictures of a dream rapidly succeeding each other without logical connection yet scarcely marred by the incoherence since the effect they seek to produce is not an emotion not a conviction but an impression of beauty or horror or ecstasy the uncertain outlines are bathed in a vague golden air of imagination and are shown to us with the magic touch of a coleridge a leopardi the touch which gives a mood a scene with scarce an obvious detail of either mood or scene we may not understand the purport of the song we understand the feeling that prompted the song as having done with reading kubla khan there remains in our mind not the pictured vision of palace or dancer but a personal participation in coleridge's heightened fancy a setting on of reverie and impression read this poem written in october eighteen forty five the philosopher enough of thought philosopher too long hast thou been dreaming unlightened in this chamber drear while summer's sun is beaming space sweeping soul what sad refrain concludes thy musings once again oh for the time when i shall sleep without identity and never care how rain may steep or snow may cover me no promised heaven these wild desires could all or half fulfil no threatened hell with quenchless fires subdue this quenchless will so said i and still say the same still to my death will say three gods within this little frame are warring night and day heaven could not hold them all and yet they all are held in me and must be mine till i forget my present entity oh for the time when in my breast their struggles will be o'er oh for the time when i shall rest and never suffer more 
i saw a spirit standing man where thou dost stand an hour ago and round his feet three rivers ran of equal depth and equal flow a golden stream and one like blood and one like sapphire seemed to be and where they joined their triple flooded tumbled in an inky sea the spirit sent his dazzling gaze down through that ocean's gloomy night then kindling all with sudden blaze the glad deep sparkled wide and bright white as the sun far far more fair than its divided sources were and even for that spirit seer i've watched and sought my lifetime long sought him in heaven hell earth and air an endless search and always wrong had i but seen his glorious eye once light the clouds that wilder me i ne'er had raised this coward cry to cease to think and cease to be i ne'er had called oblivion blessed nor stretching eager hands to death implored to change for senseless rest this sentient soul this living breath oh let me die that power and will their cruel strife may close and conquered good and conquering ill be lost in one repose some semblance of coherence may no doubt be given to this poem by making the first three and the last stanzas to be spoken by the questioner and the fourth by the philosopher even so the subject has little charm what we care for is the surprising energy with which the successive images are projected the earnest ring of the verse the imagination which invests all its changes the man and the philosopher are but the clumsy machinery of the magic lantern the more kept out of view the better conquered good and conquering ill a thought that must often have risen in emily's mind during this year and those succeeding a gloomy thought sufficiently strange in a country parson's daughter one destined to have a great result in her work of these visions which make the larger half of emily's contribution to the tiny book none has a more eerie grace than this day-dream of the fifth of march eighteen forty four sampled here by a few verses snatched out of their setting rudely enough on a sunny bray alone i lay one summer afternoon it was the marriage time of may with her young lover june the trees did wave their plumy crests the glad birds carolled clear and i of all the wedding guests was only sullen there now whether it were really so i never could be sure but as in fit of peevish woe i stretched me on the moor a thousand thousand gleaming fires seemed kindling in the air a thousand thousand silvery lyres resounded far and near methought the very breath i breathed was full of sparks divine and all my heather couch was wreathed by that celestial shine and while the wide earth echoing rung to their strange minstrelsy the little glittering spirit sung or seemed to sing to me what they sang is indeed of little moment enough a strain of the vague pantheistic sentiment common always to poets but her manner of representing the little airy symphony is charming it recalls the fairy-like brilliance of the moors at sunset when the sun slipping behind a western hill streams in level rays on to an opposite crest gilding with pale gold the fawn-coloured faded grass tangled in the film of lilac seeding grasses spread like the bloom on a grape all over the heath sparkling on the crisp edges of the heather blooms pure white wild rose colour shell tinted purple emphasizing every grey-green spur of the undergrowth of ground lichen striking every scarlet splashed white budded spray of ling an iridescent shimmering dancing effect of white and pink and purple flowers of lilac bloom of grey-green and whitish grey buds and branches all crisply moving and dancing together in the breeze on the hilltop i have quoted that windy night in a line the dim moon struggling in the sky here is another verse to show how well she watched from her bedroom's wide window 
the grey far-stretching skies above the black far-stretching moors and oh how slow that keen-eyed star has tracked the chilly grey what watching yet how very far the morning lies away such direct vital touches recall well-known passages in wuthering heights catherine's pictures of the moors that exquisite allusion to gimmerton chapel bells not to be heard on the moors in summer when the trees are in leaf but always heard at wuthering heights on quiet days following a great thaw or a season of steady rain but not alas in such fantasy and such loving intimacy with nature might much of emily's sorrowful days be passed nor was it in her nature that all her dreams should be cheerful the finest songs the most peculiarly her own are all of defiance and mourning moods so natural to her that she seems to scarcely need the intervention of words in their confession the wild melancholy and elevating music of which charlotte wisely speaks is strong enough to move our very hearts to sorrow in such verses as the following things which would not touch us at all were they written in prose which have no personal note yet listen death that struck when i was most confiding in my certain faith of joy to be strike again time's withered branch dividing from the fresh root of eternity leaves upon time's branch were growing brightly full of sap and full of silver dew birds beneath its shelter gathered nightly daily round its flowers the wild bees flew sorrow passed and plucked the golden blossom solemn haunting with a passion infinitely beyond the mere words the mere image because in some wonderful way the very music of the verse impresses reminds us declares the wholly inevitable losses of death a finer poem yet is remembrance written two years later in the march of eighteen forty five here the words and the thought are worthy of the music and the mood it has vital passion in it though it can scarcely be personal passion since fifteen wild decembers before eighteen forty five emily bronte was a girl of twelve years old companionless save for still living sisters branwell her aunt and the vicarage servants here as elsewhere in the present volume the creative instinct reveals itself in imagining emotions and not characters the artist has supplied the passion of the lover cold in the earth and the deep snow piled above thee far far removed cold in the dreary grave have i forgot my only love to love thee severed at last by time's all severing wave now when alone do my thoughts no longer hover over the mountains on that northern shore resting their wings where heath and fern leaves cover thy noble heart for ever evermore cold in the earth and fifteen wild decembers from those brown hills have melted into spring faithful indeed is the spirit that remembers after such years of change and suffering sweet love of youth forgive if i forget thee while the world's tide is bearing me along other desires and other hopes beset me hopes which obscure but cannot do thee wrong no later light has lightened up my heaven no second morn has ever shone for me all my life's bliss from thy dear life was given all my life's bliss is in the grave with thee but when the days of golden dreams had perished and even despair was powerless to destroy then did i learn how existence could be cherished strengthened and fed without the aid of joy then did i check the tears of useless passion weaned my young soul from yearning after thine sternly denied its burning wish to hasten down to that tomb already more than mine and even yet i dare not let it languish dare not indulge in memory's rapturous pain once drinking deep of that divinest anguish how could i seek the empty world again better still of a standard excellence is a little poem which by some shy ostrich prompting emily chose to call the old stoic 
riches i hold in light esteem and love i laugh to scorn and lust of fame was but a dream that vanished with the morn and if i pray the only prayer that moves my lips for me is leave the heart that now i bear and give me liberty yes as my swift days near their goal tis all that i implore in life and death a chainless soul with courage to endure throughout the book one recognizes the capacity for producing something finer and quite different from what is here produced one recognizes so much but not the author of wuthering heights grand impressions of mood and landscape reveal a remarkably receptive artistic temperament splendid and vigorous movement of lines show the artist is a poet then we are in a cul-de-sac there is no hint of what kind of poet too reserved to be consistently lyric there is not sufficient evidence of the dramatic faculty to help us on to the true scent all we can say is that we have before us a mind capable of very complete and real illusions haunted by imagination always fantastic and often terrible a temperament reserved fearless and brooding a character of great strength and ruggedness extremely tenacious of impressions we must call in monsieur ten and his milieu to account for wuthering heights this first volume reveals an overpowering imagination which has not yet reached its proper outlet it is painful in reading these early poems to feel how ruthless and horrible that strong imagination often was as yet directed on no purposed line sometimes indeed sweet fancies came to emily but often they were visions of black dungeons scenes of death and hopeless parting of madness and agony so stood i in heaven's glorious sun and in the glare of hell my spirit drank a mingled tone of seraph songs and demons moan what my soul bore my soul alone within itself may tell it is painful indeed to think that the surroundings of this violent imagination with its bias towards the capricious and the terrifying were loneliness sorrow enforced companionship with degradation a life so bitter for a long time and made so bitter through another's fault that emily welcomed her fancies even the gloomiest as a happy outlet from reality oh dreadful is the check intense the agony when the ear begins to hear and the eye begins to see when the pulse begins to throb the brain to think again the soul to feel the flesh and the flesh to feel the chain such were the verses that charlotte discovered one autumn day of eighteen forty five which surprised her with good reason by their originality in music emily was not pleased by what in her eyes so jealous of her liberty must have seemed a deliberate interference with her property my sister emily continues charlotte was not a person of demonstrative character nor one on the recesses of whose mind and feelings even those nearest and dearest to her could intrude unlicensed it took hours to reconcile her to the discovery i had made and days to persuade her that such poems merited publication i knew however that a mind like hers could not be without some latent spark of honourable ambition and refused to be discouraged in my attempts to fan that spark to flame meantime my younger sister quietly produced some of her own compositions intimating that since emily's had given me pleasure i might like to look at some of hers i could not but be a partial judge yet i thought that these verses too had a sweet sincere pathos of their own only a partial judge could find anything much to praise in gentle anne's trivial verses had the book an index of first lines what a scathing criticism on the contents would it be sweet are thy strains celestial bard i'll rest me in this sheltered bower oh i am very weary though tears no longer flow from such beginnings we too clearly foresee the hopeless bathos of the end poor child her real deep sorrows expressed in such worn-out ill-fitting phrases are as little touching as the beauty of a london shop-girl under the ready-made cast-off adornments of her second-hand finery 
charlotte however knowing the real sorrow the real meekness that inspired them not unnaturally put into the trivial verses the pathos of the author's circumstances of a truth her own poems are not such as would justify any great rigour of criticism they are often as poems actually inferior to anne's her manner of dragging in a tale or a moral at the end of a lyric having quite a comical effect yet on the whole her share of the book clearly distinguishes her as an eloquent and imaginative raconteuse at the same time that it denies her the least sprout the smallest leaf of that flowerless wreath of bays which emily might claim but at that time the difference was not so clearly distinguishable though charlotte ever felt and owned her sister's superiority in this respect it was not recognized as of a sort to quite outshine her own little tales in verse and quite outluster anne's pious effusions a packet of manuscript was selected a little packet written in three different hands and signed by three names the sisters did not wish to reveal their identity they decided on a nom de plume and chose the common north country surname of bell they did not wish to be known as women we had a vague impression that authoresses were liable to be looked on with prejudices yet their fastidious honour prevented them from wearing a mask they had no warrant for to satisfy both scruples they assumed names that might equally belong to a man or a woman in the part of yorkshire where they lived children were often christened by family names over the shops they would see sunderland Ackroyd, varied by pig hill sunderland with scarce a john or james to bear them company so there was nothing strange to them in the fashion so ingeniously turned to their own uses ellis veiled emily currer charlotte acton anne the first and last were common names enough a miss currer who was one of the subscribers to cowan's bridge may have suggested her pseudonym to charlotte at last every detail was discussed decided and the packet sent off to london to try its fortunes in the world this bringing out of our little book was hard work as was to be expected neither we nor our poems were at all wanted but for this we had been prepared at the outset though inexperienced ourselves we had read the experience of others the great puzzle lay in the difficulty of getting answers of any kind from the publishers to whom we applied being greatly harassed by this obstacle i ventured to apply to the messrs chambers of edinburgh for a word of advice they may have forgotten the circumstance but i have not for from them i received a brief and business-like but civil and sensible reply on which we acted and at last made a way ultimately the three sisters found a publisher who would undertake the work upon commission a favourable answer came from messrs eilat and jones of paternoster row who estimated the expense of the book at thirty guineas it was a great deal for the three sisters to spare from their earnings but they were eager to print eager to make sacrifices as though in some dim way they saw already the glorious goal but at present there was business to do they bought one of the numerous little primers that are always on sale to show the poor vain moth of amateur authorship how least to burn his wings little books more eagerly bought and read than any of those that they bring into the world such a publisher's guide meant for ambitious schoolboys the brontes bought and studied as anxiously as they by the end of february all was settled the type decided upon the money dispatched the printers at work emily bronte's copy is dated may seventh eighteen forty six what eagerness at the untying of the parcel in which those first copies came what disappointment checkered with ecstasy at reading their own verse unaltered yet in print an experience not so common then as now to be a poetess in those days had a certain distinction and the three sisters must have anxiously waited for a greeting the poems had been dispatched to many magazines colburn's bentley's hood's gerald's blackwood's their early idol to the edinburgh review tate's edinburgh magazine the dublin university magazine to the athenaeum the literary gazette the critic and to the daily news the times and to the britannia newspaper surely from some quarter they would hear 
such an authentic word of warning or welcome as should confirm at once their hopes or their despairs they had grown used to waiting but they had long to wait at last on july fourth the athenium reviewed their book in a short paragraph and it is remarkable that though in such reviews of the poems as appeared after the publication of jane eyre it is always currer bell's fine sense of nature currer bell's matured intellect and masterly hand that wins all the praise still in this early notice the yet unblinded critic has perceived to whom the palm is due ellis bell he places first of the three supposed brothers naming him a fine quaint spirit with an evident power of wing that may reach heights not here attempted next to him the critic ranks currer lastly anne scarce another notice did they see the little book was evidently a failure it had fallen still born from the press were all their hopes to die as soon as they were born at least they resolved not to be too soon baffled and already in the thick of their disappointment began to lay the plots of the novels they would write like our army they gained their battles by never owning they were beaten they kept it all to themselves this disappointment these resolutions when the inquisitive postman asked mr bronte if he knew who was that mr currer bell for whom so many letters always came the old gentleman answered with a sense of authority my good man there is no such person in the parish and when on rare occasions branwell came into the room where they were writing no word was said of the work that was going on not even to the sisterly ellen so near to all their hearts was any confession made of the way they spent their time we have done nothing to speak of since you were here says conscientious anne nevertheless their friend drew her conclusions about this time she came to stay at haworth and sometimes a little amused at their reticence she would tease them with her suspicions to charlotte's alarmed surprise once at this time when they were walking on the moor together a sudden change in light came into the sky look said charlotte and the four girls looked up and saw three suns shining clearly overhead they stood a little while silently gazing at the beautiful parhelion charlotte her friend and anne clustered together emily a little higher standing on a heathery knoll that is you said ellen at last you are the three sons hush cried charlotte indignant at the too shrewd nonsense of her friend but as ellen her suspicions confirmed by charlotte's violence lowered her eyes to the earth again she looked a moment at emily she was still standing on her knoll quiet satisfied and round her lips there hovered a very soft and happy smile she was not angry the independent emily she had liked the little speech End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of emily bronte by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami troubles while emily bronte was striving to create a world of fancy and romance natural to her passionate spirit the real everyday existence in which she had to work and endure was becoming day by day more anxious and troubled an almost unlivable life it seems recalling it stifled with the vulgar tragedy of branwell's woes the sordid cares that his debts entailed the wearing anxiety that watched the oncoming blindness of old mr bronte these months of eighteen forty six during which let us remember emily was writing wuthering heights must have been the heaviest and dreariest of all her days it was during their weary course that she at last perceived how utterly hopeless how insensible to good must be the remaining life of her brother for so long as the future was left him branwell never reached the limit of abasement he drank to drown sorrow to deaden memory and the flight of time he went far but not too far to turn back when the day should dawn which should recall him to prosperity and happiness he was still though perverted and debased capable of reform and susceptible to holy influences he had not finally cast away goodness and honour 
they were but momentarily discarded like rings taken off for heavy work by and by he would put them on again suddenly the future was taken away one morning about six months after his dismissal a letter came for branwell announcing the death of his former employer all he had ever hoped for lay at his feet the good wronged man was dead his wife his wealth should now make branwell glad a new life earned by sin and hatred should begin a new good life honourable and happy it was in branwell's nature to be glad when peace and honour came to him although he would make no effort to attain them in this morning he was very happy he fairly danced down the churchyard as if he were out of his mind he was so fond of that woman says my informant the next morning he rose dressed himself with care and prepared for a journey but before he had even set out from haworth two men came riding to the village post haste they sent for branwell and when he arrived in a great state of excitement one of the riders dismounted and went with him into the black bull they went into the brown parlour of the inn the cheerful wainscoted parlour where branwell had so often lorded it over his boon companions from his great three-cornered chair after some time the messenger rose and left and those who were in the inn thought they heard a strange noise in the parlour a bleeding like a calf's yet being busy people they did not go in to see if anything had happened and amid the throng of their employments the sound passed out of their ears and out of their memory hours afterwards the young girl who used to help in the housework at the inn the anne who still remembers branwell's fluent greetings found occasion to enter the parlour she went in and found him on the floor looking changed and dreadful he had fallen down in a sort of stupefied fit after that day he was an altered being the message he had heard had changed the current of his life it was not the summons he expected but a prayer from the woman he loved not to come near her not to tempt her to ruin if she saw him once the care of her children the trust of their fortunes all was forfeited she entreated him to keep away anxious perhaps in this sudden loneliness of death to retrieve the past or by some tender superstition made less willing to betray the dead than the living or it may be merely eager to retain at all costs the rank the station the honours to which she was accustomed be it as it may branwell found himself forgotten o oh, dreadful heart of woman that in one day forgets what man remembers forgetting him therewith after that day he was different he despaired and drank himself to death drinking to the grave and forgetfulness gods of his sabbath and borrowing a transient pleasure at fearful interest but to such a man the one supreme temptation is enjoyment it must be had though life and heaven go forfeit and while he caroused and by his whole manner gave indications of intense enjoyment his old father grew quite blind and day by day more delicate and short of breath ambitious charlotte pined like an eagle in a cage and emily riding wuthering heights called those affected who found the story more terrible than life it was she who saw most of her abandoned brother for anne could only shudder at his sin and charlotte was too indignant for pity but emily the stern charitable woman who spared herself no pang who loved to carry tenderly the broken-winged nestlings in her hard-working hands emily was not revolted by his weakness shall i despise the deer for his timid swiftness to fly or the leveret because it cannot die bravely or mock the death agony of the wolf because the beast is gaunt and foul to see she asks herself in one of the few personal poems she has left us no an emphatic no for emily bronte had a place in her heart for all the wild children of nature and to despise them for their natural instincts was impossible to her and thus it came about that she ceased to grow indignant at branwell's follies she made up her mind to accept with angerless sorrow his natural vices all that was left of her ready disdain was an extreme patience which expected no reform 
asked no improvement the patience she had for the leveret and the wolf things contemptible and full of harm yet not so by their own choice the patience of acquiescence and hopeless despair branwell's pity was all for himself he did not spare the pious household forced into the contamination of his evil habits nothing happens at haworth says charlotte nothing at least of a pleasant kind one little incident occurred about a week ago to sting us into life but if it give no more pleasure for you to hear than it does for us to witness you will scarcely thank me for adverting to it it was merely the arrival of a sheriff's officer on a visit to branwell inviting him either to pay his debts or take a trip to york of course his debts had to be paid it is not agreeable to lose money time after time in this way but where is the use of dwelling on such subjects it will make him no better reproaches only hardened his heart and made him feel himself more than ever abused by circumstances and fate sometimes says mr phillips he would complain of the way he was treated at home and as an instance related the following one of the sunday school girls in whom he and all his house took much interest fell very sick and they were afraid she would not live i went to see the poor little thing he said sat with her half an hour and read a psalm to her and a hymn at her request i felt very much like praying with her too he added his voice trembling with emotion but you see i was not good enough how dare i pray for another who had almost forgotten how to pray for myself i came away with a heavy heart for i felt sure she would die and went straight home where i fell into melancholy musings i wanted somebody to cheer me i often do but no kind word finds its way to my ears much less to my heart charlotte observed my depression and asked what ailed me so i told her she looked at me with a look which i shall never forget if i live to be a hundred years old which i never shall it was not like her at all it wounded me as if some one had struck me a blow in the mouth it involved ever so many things in it it was a dubious look it ran over me questioning and examining as if i had been a wild beast it said did my ears deceive me or did i hear aught and then came the painful baffled expression which was worse than all it said i wonder if that's true but as she left the room she seemed to accuse herself of having wronged me and smiled kindly upon me and said she is my little scholar and i will go and see her i replied not a word i was too much cut up when she was gone i came over here to the black bull and made a night of it in sheer disgust and desperation why could they not give me some credit when i was trying to be good in such wise the summer of eighteen forty six drew on wearily enough with increased economies in the already frugal household that branwell's debts might honourably be paid with gathering fears for the father on whom dyspepsia and blindness were laying heavy hands he could no longer see to read he the great walker who loved to ramble alone could barely grope his way about all that was left to him of sight was the ability to recognize well-known figures standing in a strong light yet he still continued to preach standing grey and sightless in the pulpit uttering what words perforce unstudied came to his lips himself in his sorrowful age and stern endurance a most noble and comprehensible sermon his spirits were much depressed for now he could no longer forget himself in his lonely studies no longer walk on the free moors alone when trouble invaded the narrow house below he lived now of necessity in intimate relation with his children he depended on them and now he made acquaintance with the heroic nature of his daughters and saw the petty drudgery of their lives and how worthily they turned it to a grace in the wearing of it and now he saw clearly the vain dependent passionate temperament of his son and knew how by the lack of training the plant had been ruined and draggled in the mire which might have beautifully flowered and borne good fruit had it been staked and supported the poor espalier thing that could not stand alone nemesis had visited his home he felt the consequences of his selfishness his arrogance his cold isolation and bitterly he mourned 
the cataract grew month by month a thickening veil that blotted out the world and month by month the old blind man sat wearily thinking through the day of his dear son's ruin for he had ever loved branwell the best and lay at night listening for his footsteps while below alone his daughter watched as wearily for the prodigal's return the three girls looked on and longed to help all that they could do they did charlotte being her father's constant helper and companion but all they could do was little they would not reconcile themselves to see him sink into blindness they busied themselves in collecting what information they could glean concerning operations upon cataract and the names of oculists but at present there was nothing to do but wait and endure for even they with their limited knowledge could see that their father's eyes were not ready yet for the surgeon's knife meanwhile they worked in secret at their novels so soon as the poems had been sent off and even when it was evident that that venture too had failed the sisters determined to try and earn a livelihood by writing they could no longer leave their home their father being helpless and branwell worse than helpless yet with ever-increasing expenses and no earnings bare living was difficult to compass the future too was uncertain should their father's case prove hopeless should he become quite blind ill incapable of work they would be homeless indeed with such a gloomy boding in their lives and with such stern impelling necessity bidding them strive and ever strive again as a baffled swimmer strives for land these three sisters began their work two of them in after time were to be known through all the world were to be influences for all time to come and a new glory in the world not known before their days were to make up with mrs browning the perfect trinity of english female fame but with little thought of this heavily and very wearily they set out upon their undertaking every evening when the sewing was put away the writing was begun the three sisters sitting round the table or more often marching round and round the room as in their schoolgirl days would hold solemn counsel over the progress of their work the division of chapters the naming of characters the progress of events was then decided so that each lent a hand to the other's work then such deliberations done the paper would be drawn out and the casual notes of the day corrected and writ fair and for an hour or more there would be no sound save the scratching of pens on the paper and the gusty wailing of the wind outside such methodical work makes rapid progress in a few months each sister had a novel completed charlotte a grave and quiet study of belgian life and character the professor and a painstaking account of a governess's trials which she entitled agnes gray emily's story was very different and less perceptibly interwoven with her own experience we all know at least the name of wuthering heights the novels were sent off and at first seemed even less likely of success than the school had been or the book of verses publisher after publisher rejected them then thinking that perhaps it was not cunning to send the three novels in a batch since the ill success of one might prejudice all the sisters sent them separately to try their chance but ever with the same result month after month came rejection at home affairs continued no less disheartening branwell often laid up with violent fits of sickness mr bronte becoming more utterly blind at last in the end of july emily and charlotte set out for manchester to consult an oculist there they heard of mr wilson as the best and to him they went but only to find that no decisive opinion could be given until their father's eyes had been examined yet not disheartened they went back to haworth for at least they had discovered a physician and had made sure that even at their father's advanced age an operation might prove successful therefore at the end of august charlotte who was her father's chief companion and the most easily spared from home took old mr bronte to manchester mr wilson pronounced his eyes ready for the operation and the old man and his daughter went into lodgings for a month i wonder how emily and anne will get on at home with branwell says charlotte accustomed to be the guide and leader of that little household hardly enough no doubt for anne was little fitted now to struggle against fate she never had completely rallied from the prolonged misery of her sojourn with branwell in that fatal house 
which was to blight their future and be blighted by them. She grew weaker and weaker, that gentle little one, so tender, so ill-fitted to her rugged and gloomy path of life. Emily looked on with a breaking heart. Trouble encompassed her on every side, her father blind in Manchester, her brother drinking himself to death at home, her sister failing, paling, day by day, and every now and then a letter would come announcing that such and such a firm of publishers had no use for Agnes Gray and Wuthering Heights. Charlotte and Manchester fared little better. The professor had been returned to her on the very day of her father's operation, when bearing this unspoken of blow as best she might, she had to stay in the room while the cataract was removed from his eyes. Exercise makes courage strong. That evening when her father in his darkened room might no longer speak or be spoken to, that very evening she began Jane Eyre. This was being braver than brave Emily, who has left us nothing save a few verses written later than Wuthering Heights. But at Haworth there was labor and to spare for every instant of the busy days, and Charlotte in Manchester found her unaccustomed leisure and unoccupied confinement very dreary. Toward the end of September Mr. Bronte was pronounced on a fair way to recovery, and he and Charlotte set out for Haworth. It was a happy homecoming, for things had prospered better than Charlotte had dared to hope during the latter weeks of her absence. Every day the old man grew stronger, and little by little his sight came back. He could see the glorious purple of the moors, Emily's moors, no less beloved in her sorrowing womanhood than in her happy hoyden time of youth. He could see his children's faces and the miserable change in Branwell's features. He began to be able to read a little, very little at a time, and by November was sufficiently recovered to take the whole duty of the three Sunday services upon himself. Not long after this time, three members of that quiet household were still further cheered by learning that Agnes Gray and Wuthering Heights had found acceptance at the hands of a publisher acceptance but upon impoverishing terms still for so much they were thankful to write and bury unread the things one has written is playing music upon a dumb piano who plays would fain be heard end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of emily bronte by agnes mary francis robinson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Wuthering Heights, Its Origin A gray old parsonage, standing among graves, remote from the world on its wind-beaten hilltop, all round the neighboring summits wild with moors, a lonely place among half-dead ash-trees and stunted thorns, the world cut off on one side by the still ranks of the serried dead, and distanced on the other by mile-long stretches of heath, such we know was Emily Bronte's home. An old, blind, disillusioned father, once prone to an extraordinary violence of temper, but now grown quiet with age, showing his disappointment with life by a melancholy cynicism that was quite sincere, two sisters both beloved one fired with genius and quick to sentiment hiding her enthusiasm under the cold demeanour of the ex-governess unsuccessful and unrecognised the other gentler dearer fairer slowly dying inch by inch of the blighting neighbourhood of vice one brother scarce less dear of set purpose drinking himself to death out of furious thwarted passion for a mistress that he might not marry these were the members of emily bronte's household herself we know inexperienced courageous passionate and full of pity was it wonderful that she summed up life in one bitter line conquered good and conquering ill her own circumstances proved the axiom true, and of other lives she had but little knowledge. Whom should she ask? The gentle Ellen, who seemed of another world, and yet had plentiful troubles of her own? The curates she despised for their narrow priggishness? The people in the village of whom she knew nothing save when sickness, wrong, or death summoned her to their homes to give help and protection? 
her life had given only one view of the world, and she could not realize that there were others which she had not seen. I am bound to avow, says Charlotte, that she had scarcely more practical knowledge of the peasantry among whom she lived than a nun has of the country people that pass her convent gates. My sister's disposition was not naturally gregarious. Circumstances favored and fostered her tendency to seclusion. Except to go to church or to take a walk on the hills, she rarely crossed the threshold of home. Though her feeling for the people round her was benevolent, intercourse with them she never sought, nor with very few exceptions ever experienced, and yet she knew them, knew their ways, their language, their family histories, she could hear of them with interest and talk of them with detail, minute, graphic, and accurate, but with them she rarely exchanged a word. Hence it ensued that what her mind had gathered of the real concerning them was too exclusively confined to those tragic and terrible traits of which, in listening to the secret annals of every rude vicinage, the memory is sometimes compelled to receive the impress. Her imagination, which was a spirit more sombre than sunny, more powerful than sportive, found in such traits materials whence it wrought creations like Heathcliff, like Earnshaw, like Catherine. Having formed these beings, she did not know what she had done. If the auditors of her work, when read in manuscript, shuddered under the grinding influence of nature so relentless and implacable, of spirits so lost and fallen, if it was complained that the mere hearing of certain vivid and fearful scenes banished sleep by night and disturbed mental peace by day, Ellis Bell would wonder what was meant and suspect the complainant of affectation. Had she but lived, her mind would of itself have grown like a strong tree, loftier, straighter, wider, spreading, and its matured fruits would have attained a mellower ripening and a sunnier bloom. But on that mind time and experience alone could work, to the influence of other intellects it was not amenable. Yet no human being is wholly free, none wholly independent of surroundings, and Emily Bronte least of all could claim such immunity. We can with difficulty just imagine her a prosperous heiress, loving and loved, high-spirited and even hoydenish, but with her cavalier fantasy informed by a gracious splendor all her own. We can just imagine Emily Bronte as Shirley Kildar, but scarcely Shirley Kildar riding Wuthering Heights. Emily Bronte, away from her moors, her loneliness, her poverty, her discipline, her companionship with genius, violence, and degradation, would have taken another color, as hydrangeas grow now red, now blue, according to the nature of the soil. It was not her lack of knowledge of the world that made the novel she wrote become Wuthering Heights, not her inexperience, but rather her experience, limited and perverse indeed, and specialized by a most singular temperament, yet close and very real. Her imagination was as much inspired by the circumstances of her life as was Anne's when she wrote The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, or Charlotte's in her masterpiece Villette. But as in each case the imagination was of a different quality, experience, acting upon it, produced a distinct and dissimilar result, a result obtained no less from the contrariety than by the harmony of circumstance. For our surroundings affect us in two ways, subtly and permanently, tinging us through and through as wine tinges water, or by some violent neighborhood of antipathetic force, sending us off at a tangent as far as possible from the antagonistic presence that so detestably environs us. The fact that Charlotte Bronte knew chiefly clergymen is largely responsible for Shirley, that satirical eulogy of the church and apotheosis of Sunday school teachers. But Emily, living in this same clerical evangelistic atmosphere, is revolted, forced to the other extreme, and while sheltering her true opinions from herself under the all-embracing term broad church, we find in her writings no belief so strong as the belief in the present use and glory of life, 
no love so great as her love for earth earth the mother and grave no assertion of immortality but a deep certainty of rest there is no note so often struck in all her work and struck with such variety of emphasis as this that good for goodness's sake is desirable evil for evil's sake detestable and that for the just and the unjust alike there is rest in the grave this quiet clergyman's daughter always hearing evil of dissenters has therefore from pure courage and revolted justice become a dissenter herself a dissenter in more ways than one never was a nature more sensitive to the stupidities and narrowness of conventional opinion a nature more likely to be found in the ranks of the opposition and with such a nature indignation is the force that most often looses the gate of speech the impulse to reveal wrongs and sufferings as they really are is overwhelmingly strong although the revelation itself be imperfect what then would this inexperienced yorkshire parson's daughter reveal the unlikeness of life to the authorized pictures of life the force of evil only conquerable by the slow revolving process of nature which admits not the eternal duration of the perverse the grim and fearful lessons of heredity the sufficiency of the finite to the finite of life to life with no other reward than the conduct of life fulfils to him that lives the all-penetrating kinship of living things heather sprig singing lark confident child relentless tyrant and not least not least to her already in its shadow the sure and universal peace of death a strange evangel from such a preacher but a faith ever more emphasized and deeply rooted in emily's mind by her incapacity to acquiesce to the stiff pragmatic teaching the narrow prejudice of the calvinists of haworth yet this very calvinism influenced her ideas this doctrine she so passionately rejected calling herself a disciple of the tolerant and thoughtful frederick maurice and writing in defiance of its flames and shriekings the most soothing consolations to mortality that i remember in our tongue nevertheless so dual natured is the force of environment this antagonistic faith repelling her to the extreme rebound of belief did not send her out from it before she had assimilated some of its sternest tenets from this doctrine of reward and punishment she learned that for every unchecked evil tendency there is a fearful expiation though she placed it not indeed in the flames of hell but in the perverted instincts of our own children terrible theories of doomed incurable sin and predestined loss warned her that an evil stock will only beget contamination the children of the mad must be liable to madness the children of the depraved bent towards depravity the seed of the poison plant springs up to blast and ruin only to be overcome by uprooting and sterilization or by the judicious grafting the patient training of many years this prejudiced and evangelical haworth had prepared the woman who rejected its hebraic dogma to find out for herself the underlying truths she accepted them in their full significance it has been laid as a blame to her that she nowhere shows any proper abhorrence of the fiendish and vindictive heathcliff she who reveals him remembers the dubious parentage of that forsaken seaport baby lascar or gypsy she remembers the ishmael idish childhood too much loved and hated of the little interloper whose hand was against every man's hand remembering this she submits as patiently to his swarthy soul and savage instincts as to his swarthy skin and gibberish that nobody could understand from thistles you gather no grapes no use she seems to be saying in waiting for the children of evil parents to grow of their own will and unassisted straight and noble the very quality of their will is as inherited as their eyes and hair heathcliff is no fiend or goblin 
the untrained doomed child of some half-savage sailor's holiday violent and treacherous and how far shall we hold the sinner responsible for a nature which is itself the punishment of some forefather's crime even for such there must be rest no possibility in the just and reverent mind of emily bronte that the god whom she believed to be the very fount and soul of life could condemn to everlasting fire the victims of morbid tendencies not chosen by themselves no purgatory and no everlasting flame is needed to purify the sins of heathcliff his grave on the hillside will grow as green as any other spot of grass moor sheep will find the grass as sweet heath and harebells will grow of the same colour on it as over a baby's grave for life and sin and punishment and with death to the dying man he slips his burden then on to other shoulders and no visions mar his rest i wondered how any one could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth so ends the last page of wuthering heights so much for the theories of life and evil that the clash of circumstance and character struck out from emily bronte it happened as we know that she had occasion to test these theories and but for that she could never have written wuthering heights not that the story the conception would have failed after all there is nothing more appalling in the violent history of that upland farm than many a midland manor set thick in elms many a wild country house of wales or cornwall could unfold stories more socially painful than the mere brute violence of the earnshaws of madness and treachery stories of girls entrapped unwillingly into a lunatic marriage that the estate might have an heir legends of fearful violence of outcast children dishonoured wives horrible and persistent evil who in the secret places of his memory stores not up such haunting gossip and emily familiar with all the wild stories of haworth for a century back and nursed on grisly irish horrors tales of seventeen ninety eight tales of oppression and misery emily with all this eerie lore at her fingertips would have the less difficulty in combining and working the separate motives into a consistent whole that she did not know the real people whose history she knew by heart no memory of individual manner dominance or preference for an individual type caught and disarranged her theories her conception being the completer from her ignorance this much her strong reason and her creative power enabled her to effect but this is not all this is the plot but to make a character speak act rave love live die through a whole lifetime of events even as the readers feel convinced he must have acted must have lived and died this demands at least so much experience of a somewhat similar nature as may serve for a base to one's imagination a reserve of certainty and reassurance on which to draw in times of perplexity and doubt branwell who sat to Anne sorrily enough for the portrait of Henry Huntingdon, served his sister Emily, not indeed as a model, a thing to copy, but as a chart of proportions by which to measure, and to which to refer for correct investiture the inspired idea. Mr. Weems Reed, whose great knowledge of the Bronte history and still greater kindness in admitting me to his advantages, as much as might be, I cannot sufficiently acknowledge this capable critic perceives a bona fide resemblance between the character of heathcliff and the character of branwell bronte as he appeared to his sister emily so much bearing in mind the verse concerning the leveret i own i cannot see branwell seems to me more clearly akin to heathcliff's miserable son than to heathcliff but that in depicting heathcliff's outrageous thwarted love for catherine emily did draw upon her experience of her brother's suffering this extract from an unpublished lecture of mr reed's will sufficiently reveal it was in the enforced companionship of this lost and degraded man that emily received i am sure many of the impressions which were subsequently conveyed to the pages of her book has it not been said over and over again by critics of every kind 
that Wuthering Heights reads like the dream of an opium eater? And here we find that during the whole time of the writing of the book, an habitual and avowed opium eater was at Emily's elbow. I said that perhaps the most striking part of Wuthering Heights was that which deals with the relations of Heathcliff and Catherine after she had become the wife of another. Whole pages of the story are filled with the ravings and ragings of the villain against the man whose life stands between him and the woman he loves. Similar ravings are to be found in all the letters of Branwell Bronte written at this period of his career, and we may be sure that similar ravings were always on his lips, as moody and more than half mad, he wandered about the rooms of the parsonage at Haworth. Nay, I have found some striking verbal coincidences between Branwell's own language and passages in Wuthering Heights. In one of his own letters, there are these words in reference to the object of his passion. My own life without her will be hell. What can the so-called love of her wretched sickly husband be to her compared with mine? Now turn to Wuthering Heights and you will read these words. Two words would comprehend my future, death and hell existence after losing her would be hell yet i was a fool to fancy for a moment that she valued edgar linton's attachment more than mine if he loved with all the powers of his puny being he couldn't love in eighty years as much as i could in a day so much share in wuthering heights branwell certainly had he was a page of the book in which his sister studied he served as to an artist's temperament all things unconsciously serve for the rough block of granite out of which the work is hewn and even while with difficulty enduring his vices emily undoubtedly learned from them those darker secrets of humanity necessary to her tragic incantation they served her those dreaded passionate outbreaks of her brothers even as the moors she loved the fancy she courted served her strange divining wand of genius that conjures gold out of the miriest earth of common life strange and terrible faculty laying up its stores and half mechanically drawing its own profit out of our slightest or most miserable experiences noting the gesture with which the mother hears of her son's ruin catching the faint varying shadow that the white wind-shaken window blind sends over the dead face by which we watch drawing its life from a thousand deaths humiliations losses with a hand in our sharpest joys and bitterest sorrows this faculty was emily bronte's and drew its profit from her brother's shame here ended branwell's share in producing wuthering heights but it is not well to ignore his claim to its entire authorship for in the contemptuous silence of those who know their falsity such slanders live and thrive like unclean insects under fallen stones the vain boast of an unprincipled dreamer half mad with opium half drunk with gin meaning nothing but the desire to be admired at any cost has been given too much prominence by those lovers of sensation who prefer any startling lie to an old truth their ranks have been increased by the number of those who, ignorant of the true circumstances of Emily's life, found it impossible that an inexperienced girl could portray so much violence and such morbid passion. On the contrary, given these circumstances, none but a personally inexperienced girl could have treated the subject with the absolute and sexless purity which we find in Wuthering Heights. How infect commonplace and ignominious would branwell relying on his own recollections have made the thwarted passion of a violent adventurer for a woman whose sickly husband both despise that purity as of polished steel as cold and harder than ice that freedom in dealing with love and hate as audacious as an infant's love for the bright flame of fire could only belong to one whose intensity of genius was rivaled by the narrowness of her experience, an experience limited not only by circumstances, but by a nature impervious to any fierier sentiment than the natural love of home and her own people, beginning before remembrance and as unconscious as breathing. 
the critic having emily's poems and the few remaining verses and letters of branwell cannot doubt the incapacity of that unnerved and garrulous prodigal to produce a work of art so sustained passionate and remote for in no respect does the terse fiery imaginative style of emily resemble the weak disconnected now vulgar now pretty mannerisms of branwell there is indeed scant evidence that the writer of emily's poems could produce wuthering heights but there is at any rate the impossibility that her work could be void of fire concentration and wild fancy as great an impossibility as that vulgarity and tawdriness should not obtrude their ugly heads here and there from under branwell's finest phrases and since there is no single vulgar trite or macabre like effusion throughout wuthering heights and since heathcliff's passion is never once treated in the despicable would-be worldly fashion in which branwell describes his own sensations and since at the time that wuthering heights was written he was manifestly and by his own confession too physically prostrate for any literary effort we may conclude that branwell did not write the book on the other side we have not only the literary evidence of the similar qualities in wuthering heights and in the poems of ellis bell but the express and reiterated assurance of charlotte bronte who never even dreamed it would seem that it could be supposed her brother wrote the book the testimony of the publishers who made their treaty with ellis bell of the servant martha who saw her mistress writing it and most convincingly of all to those who have appreciated the character of emily bronte the impossibility that a spirit so upright and so careless of fame should commit a miserable fraud to obtain it indeed so baseless is this despicable rumour that to attack it seems absurd only sometimes it is wise to risk an absurdity puny insects left too long unhurt may turn out dangerous enemies irretrievably damaging the fertile vine on which they fastened in the security of their minuteness to the three favouring circumstances of emily's masterpiece which we have already mentioned the neighbourhood of her home the character of her disposition the quality of her experience a fourth must be added inferior in degree and yet not absolutely unimportant this is her acquaintance with german literature and especially with hoffmann's tales in emily bronte's day romance and germany had one significance it is true that in london and in prose the german influence was dying out but in distant haworth and in the writings of such poets as emily would read in scott in southey most of all in coleridge with whose poems her own have so distinct an affinity it is still predominant of the materialistic influence of italy of atheist shelley byron with his audacity and realism sensuous keats she would have little experience in her remote parsonage and had she known them they would probably have made no impression on a nature only susceptible to kindred influences thackeray her sister's hero might have never lived for all the trace of him we find in emily's writings never is there any single allusion in her work to the most eventful period of her life that sight of the lusher fields and taller elms of middle england that glimpse of hurrying vast london that night on the river the sun slipping behind the masts doubly large through the mists and smoke in which the houses bridges ships are all spectral and dim no hint of this nor of the sea nor of belgium with its quaint foreign life nor yet of that french style and method so carefully impressed upon her by monsieur Reger, and which so decidedly moulded her elder sister's art but in the midst of her business at haworth we catch a glimpse of her reading her german book at night as she sits on the hearth rug with her arm around keeper's neck glancing at it in the kitchen where she is making bread with the volume of her choice propped up before her and by the style of the novel jotted down in the rough almost simultaneously with her reading we know that to her the study of german was not like french and music the mere necessary acquirement of a governess but an influence that entered her mind and helped to shape the fashion of her thoughts so much preface is necessary to explain not the genius of emily bronte but the conditions of that genius there is no use saying more the aim of my writing has been missed if the circumstances of her career 
are not present in the mind of my reader. It is too late at this point to do more than enumerate them and briefly point to their significance. Such criticism in face of the living work is all too much like glancing in a green and beautiful country at a map from which one may indeed ascertain the roads that lead to it and away, and the size of the place in relation to surrounding districts, but which can give no recognizable likeness of the scene which lies all around us with its fresh life forgotten and its beauty disregarded. Therefore, let us make an end of theory and turn to the book on which our heroine's fame is stationed, fronting eternity. It may be that in unraveling its story and noticing the manner in which its facts of character and circumstance impressed her mind, we may for a moment be admitted to a more thorough and clearer insight into its working than we could earn by the completest study of external evidence, the most earnest and sympathizing criticism. End of chapter 14